All right. So good afternoon. Welcome everybody to the Tuesday's community chat. We've got Julie Fetterman, Amherst Public Health Director with us today, and your town manager, Paul Bachelman. My name is Brianna Sundred, Communications Manager for the town. Okay, so just to, as a reminder, in order to ask a question during today's session, you could use the Q&A button in Zoom. You can also raise your hand in Zoom or press star nine if you're joining us from a telephone. We'd love to have um, some people come into the room and ask us questions. So um, if you feel comfortable with that, please do. All right, so before we launch into our questions, I'm gonna give a chance for both Paul and Julie to provide some updates if they have them. Sure, I'll start. Um, thanks for everybody for being here. So there are, the, the it's everything's kind of changing it feels like as we uh, start talking more and more about reopening. What does that look like? Are we safe enough to start reopening things? And I think this is a, we're in a sort of a pivotal moment as people start to look at May 18th, which is in the expiration of the governor's uh, last order, what happens after that? And, um, you know, these are all malleable situations where people have different views of things. And so our position right now is that we still think that it's really important to be observing social distance rules and that all of our decision making is based on that science that supports those social distancing things. So as you see us continue to work out uh, decisions, they will be based on, on, those, on, the, on the science that this is still a pandemic, the disease is still there, and we want to continue to minimize the spread of the disease. And the best way to do that is to maintain that those six feet social distance. And you'll see some of the governor's orders coming out that talked about masks um, and, and or face, you know, covering your, your nose and mouth to minimize the spread if you can't properly social distance or if you're ever inside in a business, for instance. Um, so that's sort of the context. The other piece that we're working a lot on is um, dwelling on what does it look like when the town starts to um, think about its services. And we have, every, have enabled everybody to work as remotely as possible, as long as possible. And we are having those kind of internal discussions. And then on top of that, layered on top of that is what does it look like for our budget going forward in terms of, um, you know, how are we going to do an FY20 and where are we going to be going in FY21? We will talk a lot more about that on Monday, May 11th at 5.30. The interim finance director, um, Sonia Aldridge and I will make a presentation to the school committee, the finance, to the um, town council and to board of library trustees. Um, so that's sort of just opening statement for me. Julie, is there anything you want to throw in there? Sure, thanks Paul. Um, I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, Mother's Day is coming up. Um, I think that's always one of the harbingers of spring. Um, and I know that um, some people have mothers that they want to celebrate. Um, I think it's just a moment to remember that we also want to keep our mothers healthy along with all our other family members. So I'm encouraging people to make a phone call and to not do a visit. Um, we're still in this time where we're staying home and it's hard when there's celebrations and, um, you know, FaceTime, Zoom, phone calls, um, really encouraging people to do that instead of visits in, in person. Drive-bys with balloons, that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, so happy Mother's Day. Um, and then I thought I would talk about masks again, face coverings. I think that... Um, this continues to be an area where there's some questions and some confusion. So we do know that the governor passed an order that went into effect um, yesterday. Um, and we're still getting questions about what that order really means. So again, as Paul was saying, what we're really looking at is that social distancing, staying home, staying six feet apart is really the best thing we can do to prevent transmission of the disease. On the other hand, we know that people have to go to the grocery store. We know some people are going to work. So in those situations, you should be wearing some type of face covering. Doesn't have to be a purchased mask. It can be anything, preferably with two layers of fabric that covers your nose and your mouth and is, and is um, 
you know, flush with your cheeks, tight around your cheeks, because you don't want to be letting things ex escape around the edges of the mask. Um, so that being said, when you leave the house, you should have a mask with you. It doesn't mean that the minute you go out the door, you have to put a mask on. It means that if you're out and about outside, you want to have a mask with you because if you're going to be within six feet of people, you've got to be able to put that mask on. And sometimes you're going out for a walk, you're going for a hike, and you're thinking, well, I'll be able to keep six foot distance. But the problem is sometimes you can't. You're on a sidewalk, you're on a trail, wherever you are, you've got to be able to, as you see folks approach, if you can't do the six foot distance to put that on. Um, we understand that when you're exercising or working really hard, it's really physically, it's hard to use a mask. So again, if you're not able to use social distancing, um, then you're going to need to wear a mask. So if you're out for a run, really try to plan it during a time and a place where you're not going to be passing people. Because even as you're passing people, especially the more, the more hard you're breathing, um, you know, you're exhaling out to folks. And so the idea is to be protecting people, even if you're just passing them or passing them on the sidewalk. So I just wanted to, um, to mention that again, because people have been a little confused about the governor's order. And just always remember it sits, masks sit within that context of the social distancing, which is really the primary way that you prevent prevent transmission master for the moments when you can't so that was it for my update and that's that's a that's a great reminder julie with with the current changes uh, from the governor and i'll take this quick opportunity to say that if you or someone you know needs a mask in amherst mm -hmm. and doesn't have one um, please get in touch with us we we have uh, a form you can fill out online at amherstma.gov get involved to request one or to uh, volunteer to make masks. Um, if a web form is not your um, style, you can call the town manager's office at 413-259-3002 and Jen or Angela will um, help you get a mask or help get your family members a mask. So we, we do have some questions here. Um, I'll start with this one that just came in. The mass DPH data suggests that more than half of Amherst confirmed COVID-19 cases are at the Center for Extended Care. Is that correct? And what is the town doing to limit such outbreaks? Thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, yes, the Center for Extended Care uh, does have um, approximately half of the cases that are attributed to Amherst. The uh, fire department and our public health nurse and myself keep in close contact with the Center for, for Extended Care. Um, we also keep in contact with other congregate living sites for elders. Um, we feel very lucky that the Center for Extended Care has been incredibly proactive in protecting their, their elders in putting infection control practices into place early on. Their early rounds of testing had shown no cases. Um, I think that one of the realities is that once um, a disease enters a congregate lit living set setting like this, um, it's difficult, very difficult to control spread. The Department of Public Health have been helping the Center for Extended Care. Um, and as I said, we're in close contact with them. The fire department has been able to get them some supplies that they needed. Department of Public Health has been able to help them with some extra staffing. Um, so the way that we prevent these outbreaks is by offering assistance to folks, to administrators at um, senior living facilities and making sure that all of the administration in these entities are really up to date on what they should be doing proactively to prevent disease entering their facilities and then preventing spread. Yeah, so I, I just want to weigh in on that too, because this is, um, so one of my best friend's mother lived there and, and uh, had died there too, and, and it, it, make, it made it more personal. And um, 
and from their experience, it was that you know they felt that really comfortable with the services that were being provided. Um, but it's an insidious disease, and I think even if you're doing everything right, this type of thing can happen, and it's a highly contagious disease. So, hearing you know, seeing how quickly it can get into a congregate setting, with Julie to support what Julie said is that it's, a, it's, a, it's so dangerous in a congregate setting, which is why there's so much attention being placed on places where there are a lot of people living together. Um, and, and just the, the insidious nature of it, that it, it can insinuate itself, even if you're doing everything right. So um, that's why, I mean, early, early on, you know, we saw a lot of our um, senior housing folks um, taking proactive measures, you know, limiting visit visitations and things like that just to, to protect the, the folks living there. Um, but even with all that, these things can happen, so. Great, thank you. So we, we have another question here that's asking if you could explain a little bit about how contact tracing is now working. Sure, so I think folks are hearing a lot about contact tracing. Contact tracing is something that's not new. It's what we've always done with communicable diseases. Now that we have this communicable disease that is worldwide, um, the general population is learning about this. So we're really lucky in Massachusetts that there's a partnership between the state and Partners in Health to create a thousand person um, entity of contact tracers. The name for this entity is the CTC, um, the Contact Tracing Collabor Collaborative. So what's happening is this entity is going to be helping all the local health departments that um, normally do their own contact tracing. So in Amherst, we have our public health nurse, Jennifer Brown, and uh, two school nurses helping us with contact tracing. What contact tracing is, is when someone has a communicable disease, we need to look at who else may have been exposed to that disease. So as we're seeing COVID-19 cases uh, pick up, each one of those cases is contacted, a conversation is had with them, and any contacts they may have had in the 48 hours before they were sick get listed, and then they're contacted the fact who, who, the, who those contacts came in contact with remains confidential. Um, so it could have been a quick 15 minute contact with someone um, in, in, um, that, that they didn't know very well. So sometimes we're calling people and they're not expecting our call because they don't know that this person is sick. And of course we're not saying who is sick. Um, and then each one of those person people it is explained to them about the symptoms of COVID-19 and the importance of them going into quarantine for two weeks. We then keep in touch with them for two weeks, daily phone calls, sometimes texts if that's preferred by the person to monitor how they're doing, to also see if they have needs while they're in quarantine because it's not easy to stay home for two weeks. Not everyone has the, all the supports in place to get what they need during that time. So what the state has done, recognizing that um, this will um, overwhelm our normal, sim normal systems for tracking folks, is they have all these volunteers, well, some are volunteers, some are being paid actually, who um, will be reaching out and doing the contact tracing, helping us in town. And so one of the reasons we wanted to bring this up today is, is because, um, if you get a phone call from an 800 number, mm -hmm. you should pick it up. You should answer the call because they are using 800 phone numbers to call people to do the contact tracing. Now, many of us have gotten in the habit of not picking up 800 calls because we think it's just gonna be some kind of marketing. Answer the call. That's what we're trying to get across to people because it could be that you have come in contact with someone and so they'll be reaching out to you to have a conversation about going into quarantine. One of the other things about the contact tracing collaborative is that there are people who speak many different languages. So if someone speaks another language, um, part of of that will be trying to be determined before the phone call is made. But even once the phone call is made, if someone picks up 
and and they're not an English speaker, that'll be determined and they'll get someone to call back who speaks the language of, of the person being contacted. So we really want to, to um, enforce with folks that we want you to answer the call. And you'll be seeing this talked about in the news. Um, and if you know someone who's that you can share this information with, we'd really appreciate that. Well, yeah, one other thing I've heard people say is they will not ask you for your social security number. So if someone calls you and asks you for your social security number, don't give it. That's not legit. They will never ask you. But you've heard the governor say, please answer your phone. This is the most vital po point of our, the most important thing we can be doing right now is members of the public. Right. You know if they'll leave a message if you don't pick up? Hmm. That is a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I will have to look into that. I, I don't know. Okay, so we've got um, a question here and, and I've gotten this a couple of times in the past few weeks. Um, when will we know about summer programs um, such as LSSC summer camps, pools, sports leagues? Do you think, when do you think we'll have more information about those? That's a very good question. Um, we're getting that question a lot. Um, those of us who work in public health are on twice weekly phone calls with the state uh, asking for guidance around this because people um, really would like to know. What we're hearing is that we won't really have answers till that, to that question until very close to May 18th. Um, it's being looked at each one of these sectors, camps, pools, you know, what can open safely, what, what is necessary to the economy as it starts to open up, and how do we keep people safe if some of these things are opened up? And Paul, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I, I think, you know, the, our staff are asking the same questions too about what is, what is the um, right timing of it. So the, as soon as we can get the word out to folks, um, they, a lot of our programs wouldn't happen, wouldn't begin until the end of June anyway, but people like to plan and um, we just don't have the answers at this moment. We are, as Julie said, everybody's driving to that May 18th deadline at this point in time. So this, this question's kind of related. Um, this person heard the governor might be allowing golf courses to open mm -hmm. and they're wondering if that means the golf courses in Amherst will also open. Yeah, so the governor, I think just a few minutes ago actually announced that golf courses would, are able to reopen. Um, and that means that uh, the golf course that the town owns, which is Cherry Hill Golf Course, will reopen probably not until Tuesday. Um, May, what's that, May 12th, uh, because they have to get some things set up. Uh, there will not be allowed, they will not be allowed to uh, utilize golf carts. Uh, there'll be 15 minutes in between uh, each group goes out on the golf course. And again, all these things may change over time, but that's, those are the opening um, guidance uh, for our, our folks. We have been maintaining the Cherry Hill Golf Course so that it's in good shape, ready for people to play. Uh, this weekend is supposed to be terrible weather, so we're not too worried about losing the weekend, but um, they fully expect to be able to open up on May 12th for those who like to golf. And that might be the only outlet for a lot of folks, and maybe there'll be more people who want to take up the sport. Um, as, for, as far as uh, Amherst Golf, we have not talked with them. I assume that the Amherst Golf Club will be following the same um, guidance they and they had opened at one point and then had to close once the um, requirement to, to close came out. Um, Hickory Ridge, uh, as you know, is I think they've pretty much closed up uh, permanently. Uh, and so they I don't anticipate that they will be open, but I just don't know that. Great. I'm going to take this quick chance to remind our attendees to feel free to pop a question into the Q&A button or raise your hand um, in Zoom so we can acknowledge your, your question. Um, we, have, we have another comment here that this person sees a lot of paving going on, which they're happy to see, uh, but they worry how safe, um, how the crews can do this work safely in regards to face coverings and distancing and whatnot. 
Yeah, so that so we're really happy to see the paving going on. There's so much paving need in the in the town. Uh, they're paving Pelham Road. They were paving it yesterday. They probably are paving today too. Uh, Southeast Street is another major paving project, and then we're we're getting other paving lined up with funds that we have. It's it's it is a, a job that can be done outside and with proper social distancing. Um, our police officers uh, will be wearing the people the police officers who are working details will be. Um, wearing masks. They weren't official initially, but the chief has issued an order that they will all be wearing face coverings to uh, to um, make sure that they, they stay safe because our, our frontline people are really important for us to stay healthy. Uh, the paving is actually done by private contractors. They are aware of what the rules are in terms of what construction, how construction has to be properly socially distanced. And so we make sure that they understand that and they're, they're responsible for maintaining that social distance um, for their employees. Is there anything, Julie, you want to add about that? No, I think that um, working outside is a great environment and um, pe people who work outside in the hot weather especially will be using their judgment. I think when they're, when they're more than six feet apart from each other, it won't be unusual to see them um, pulling their masks down or not wearing them. But when they are coming close together, then they, they will be wearing masks to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, again, it is okay if people are not six feet, um, within six feet, for people to not be wearing a mask. And, you know, you can just imagine what it's like out there doing this really hot work. If you see people who are spaced out along a line and they're not wearing masks, that's okay. Um, so just just to let people know that because I know we're all concerned uh, when we see folks without a mask. Mm -hmm. we, we have a question here that um, that asks if, if, so, if someone witnesses more than 10 people in a gathering or at a certain location or witnesses people that should have masks but don't, um, can they call someone? What should they do? I guess I'm answering that one. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, this is going to become more and more frequent, I think, because we do want to educate people about utilizing masks when they're um, when they can't achieve the six foot social distance. Uh, this goes for public places. And um, so if you see someone, if, if someone's having a gathering at their home in their private residence, and there's more than 10 people there, it's probably not something that we're going to be able to do anything about. Um, you know, if people are around a fire pit in, in their backyard and there's more than 10 people in, on private land, probably not something we, we're going to be able to do anything about. If it's noise, a noise issue or a nuisance, that's when you call 911 and our police department will respond to that and address the, the, the nuisance issue that you know, is too loud or there's some, something like that. Um, but in general, people on their private property, it's, it's basically different rules. It's more people in public settings and on in um, businesses where we'll be focusing our attention. And when police do respond, they're not going to have a ticket book that issues a $300 fine. They, they, you know, our police force has been uh, educated to help educate the public as well about what's why face coverings are important and how they can achieve it. Um, easily at home. And there's no excuse for someone not to have a face, if you, face covering. If you have a t-shirt at home, you can achieve face covering. So um, there are lots of different ways to, to achieve that goal. Uh, so you don't say, I don't have a mask. Um, there's lots of ways to make that happen. Great. Uh, I'm going to, we're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to remind our attendees who are live with us. Now's your chance to um, put your question in the Q&A box or to raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I've got one last question here that was submitted um, or, or an observation rather that they've noticed more traffic downtown and they mm -hmm. see more businesses um, reopening. And just is that the sense, is that the trend um, with businesses in downtown Amherst right now? Yeah, it's really interesting because I'm downtown every day. So I'm in town hall right now. Um, and there's a handful of people in town hall. And that's typically how the day works. There's only a couple people on every floor because um, we really work to maintain our social distance, but the, the business of the town continues. And um, so there's a lot of work to be done. It, you know, it's actually business of the town has gone up in a lot of ways. Um, 
so but, but just in the last week or so i've noticed a lot more cars downtown the parking lots have a few more cars in them um i think the warm weather brings people out they may park here and then go for for a walk i think businesses initially had envisioned a short uh closing and now as they see that this is might be extending for the foreseeable future for weeks months um they're trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to maintain ourselves and let's, how do we start to offer more things? I noticed um, some, you know, Amherst Coffee is now offering um, services, not not beverages necessarily, but they, they can offer food uh, that for takeout or for pickup. And, you know, it's amazing the adaptability of many of our um, businesses on how they're going to uh, compete in this new environment. So they're, everybody's, you know, a lot of the restaurants are coming up with new ways and uh, figuring out ways to pivot. And um, so a, a lot of restaurants, you can go to the chamber and the bid websites and they can, they list what's open and a lot of restaurants are up and running. So you can get takeout um, from a lot of places. And I, you can see them when you're downtown, you'll see people standing socially distanced outside the business waiting to pick out pick up their bag of food that they had pre-ordered, paid for in advance, and then they put it on a table outside the restaurant, you just pick it up and go. So have you noticed that, Julie? Have you or have you been out yeah. much? No, I don't go out much, that's for sure. <laughs> I've been home for about two months, it feels. Um, but I do go out in the car occasionally. Folks in town hall are really nice to come up to my car window and hand me things if I need them. Um, and I like to take a cruise through town and see what's going on. So yes, I've noticed that also. Um, and I'm really, you know, because in infection controls my jam, I'm pretty excited about the way restaurants have come up with really safe ways to um, continue to allow people to get takeout. Um, I think takeout for folks who can afford it is, um, you know, it's a little bit of comfort of there's a little bit of normality because you can't go out many places, you can't do things. So I see people looking pretty happy with their, their bags of takeout or their bubble tea. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it helps to provide a little normalcy. Um, yeah, and I think, um, you know, after the initial shock and all the fear and all the losses, um, a lot of our businesses are starting to say, okay, I'm going to try and operate in this different way. And, and I think it's great because we want to, we want our businesses to be able to survive. And I think they've really um, done a great job in helping to keep people safe while they do provide the takeout mm -hmm. services. Yeah. The, the, the second grade word of the week for my daughter was adapt. So I, <laughs> so I, she learned that word this week and I think we all are. And I think the businesses too. So mm -hmm. very appropriate. All right, so unless there's anything else coming from our live attendees, I don't see that. Um, that's all we're gonna have time for today. Mm -hmm. So thank you both for joining us and for all the updates. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be back next Tuesday and Thursday at noon, same link, same phone number to join. And if you have any follow-up questions from today or in general, please email us at info at amherstma.gov or call the town manager's office at 413-259-3002. Any, any parting last words? Oh, thanks, Brianna. I, thank you so much for all the organization you do for all these things. We do, we do, this is a lot more stuff than we normally do, but we think it's really important. Thanks for organizing it. Yes, my thank pleasure. You. Thank you Stay both. Happy, everyone. It will eventually get warm again. And happy Mother's Day. You're right, for both right. of you. Thank, thank you. you.